Okay, guys, if you watched our video where we were catching up on fall planting, you know that this row is our collard row. And yes, I am sitting down. Um, we planted three varieties of collards on this row. We planted Alabama Blue, White Cabbage Mountain Collard, and we planted Green Glaze Collard. And the one that is standing out to me right now that is just absolutely... Uh oh, get it now. <laughs> I think that's one of my new boys. Um, is this green glaze? This green glaze collard is just so pretty to me. Oh my goodness, like I stand in awe. I don't know. Is that is that Zig? Okay, that's Hope. I thought it was one of the new ones. Aw, he sounds kind of funny. He's got a little deepness to his voice. A big boy. Okay, so yeah. Sorry about that, getting distracted there. I love my boys. They are so handsome. And they do a good job in taking care of the flock. Now the new one that you're hearing, he's just learning. Every now and then he'll... He'll still run from one of the girls, but he's getting there. So, yeah. These guys here are just absolutely just stunning to me. I'm very excited to try them. As you can see, this row um, has been planted pretty intensely, as I said I would. Um, but you'll notice the back end there. That's probably about the back six feet of this row barely had any germination and I think I figured out why um, we were in the process of realizing that our drip irrigation was damaged and so I believe that the end of this row was not getting enough water on this side too you can see there's a little bit of difference in germination as well on that end and it's the same thing across the board so I guess when the pressure got um, it's like I swear I cut on the camera and like everything and everyone so I think the pressure towards the end of the row wasn't enough for that area to get water then when we realized it of course we started uh, watering overhead and we've been doing that since um, what I'm going to do though instead of replanting that area and I believe those ones that are down there for the most part are not going to do much I think that they're pretty well stunted but what I'm going to do is I'm going to start thinning out this row um, these areas where it's pretty thick where there are some really good sized ones and I'm going to move them down there on that end and that will give these ones that are pretty good size some room to continue to grow and give us a sustainable crop so we're going to get started on that when you're thinning a lot of people now here's the thing about thinning collards collards are edible at whatever stage these baby collards like this would be phenomenal in just like a salad like they're they're really good now i've not tried the this particular variety as baby um the green glaze collard however i imagine that it would have a similar flavor um, as most collars would even as uh, baby green so some of your salad mixes will even have baby collards in there Just a few of them will because collards can be a little bit um, ir irritating to the GI track of a lot of people you won't find baby collards in many greens but you can find them in some um, you won't find them in many green mixes as far as salads because most people need them cooked but I will eat them raw and enjoy every last bit of it 
I actually think I prefer them that way overcooked as a baby green in a salad. Um, but that's just my preference. So, you know, the easiest way to do this, um, what I'm going to do is I don't want to, the bigger ones, I don't want to bother too much. They're pretty well established. I don't want to move them. All right. But if a big one like this one here, it's a good size one, but it's got a medium size one beside it, very close. You can see the root there. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. So we've got the big one here. That's the green glaze. And this one here is something else. Probably, that's probably the white cabbage mountain collar. So that one is the one we're going to move. All right. So the only thing that's required is just to be gentle. As long as your soil is fairly moist, they should pull up pretty easily. And voila. That's it. And we got a good bit of the root system there, as you can see. So, and it's interesting, I'm surprised that you can see that because they were planted so closely, this one did get a little leggy reaching for the light. And so what that means is when I plant it in its new location, I'm going to make sure the soil is not here at the root level, but I'm going to come up to, to here. Okay. And the reason for that is just to make sure it's nice and stable in the ground. Yeah. So I'm going to pull up a few more and then we'll go over and get them all planted together. Okay. I realized that my camera woman was tied up for the day so I'm not going to be able to show you how I did that exactly but I'll tell you I dug out a hole about an inch and a half deep um, depending on the particular plant and I laid the plant in root and that curve that I showed you earlier where it kind of got leggy looking for sun I put that down in the hole and I put the dirt um, right all the way up until the bottom leaves okay so I'll show you what that looks like after it's done you can see right here that's one of the ones that I just set out so all of that part that was um, leggy and curved a little bit from being too closely planted is now in the ground and I'm being careful when I am pulling these to thin to not choose ones that seem way smaller than the rest of them. Those could be stunted and there's no point in setting those out. For instance, those there very likely are not going to do anything. Um, they're just not going to do anything. Uh, but these other ones that are small that are still thriving. Um, they have a good color on them. They're nice and green, nice and healthy, and um, they are comparable in size to the surrounding plants. That's a good indication that this is a plant that we can pull and relocate to a, another location in this row, and it's going to continue to thrive and give us a good yield. So I'm going to keep working on this. Um, I have this section here all the way back to the end of that drip tape there uh, and all of that there that I can set some out it was like I, I think it was about six or eight that I just set out just now um, so I need to pull some more and that's not gonna be a problem when you look at how densely planted everything is here and I actually this row here um, to the right of where these collars are is where our arugula was previously and what I'm gonna do is gonna start bringing in some more soil to fill this row up and then I'm also gonna be putting over there some cabbages so lots of work to get done in here and all of these brassicas are going to be very appealing to all of the pests and we're already fighting quite a few in the high tunnel 
So in addition to that, if you watched our garlic video, I'm also going to be using some of those smaller garlic cloves to plant along with these brassicas to kind of give our our seedlings a fighting chance to get nice and established before the pests recognize that they are here. So far so good. This area looks really well. This is um, opposite of the area where we're having a, a really bad issue with the aphids. So what I do is I come in here and I do my work on this side of the high tunnel first and then I go and do work on that side so as not to literally bring the aphids over on my shoes or on my clothes or hands, gloves. You know, we don't want to help them travel at all. So that is a technique that you it may seem crazy, but in nursing, we are always taught to um, start at the cleanest in environment and work your way down. You know, so if you're, you know, you're bathing someone, you want to, you wouldn't clean their bottom and then go to their face. That's just obvious. So as far as infestation goes, it's the same thing. You start at the area where there's a least of an inf infestation or no infestation and work your way to the worst. At home, please try to keep that in mind too. Even though uh, we are set up more commercially, this is just basic reasoning and it works for everybody. If you have an infestation, work in that area last. Um, and sometimes due to, um, just different circumstances, I've had to come in and work in that area first. And when that happens, I literally go in the house and I change clothes and then I come back out and then work in the other area. Aphids are horrible. And once you get an infestation, like you never get rid of it and it can go from bad to done overnight if, if you're not careful. So it's worth going in the house and changing clothes. I mean, that's what we have a washing machine for. Okay, that's my rant. I'm so when the frost happened, we did get some damage that I was not, I don't know, maybe it's just been a while since I've grown spinach um, outside of the hot tunnel. The hot tunnel kind of spoils you a little bit. I didn't think that there would be any issues with uh, any damage. But not only did I get damage to the spinach, but I also got some damage on our cauliflower and the cabbages that we set out. They just, they're gone all together, but they were pretty small. Let me show you the cauliflower. So you can see some damage on that leaf there and there as well and here. Uh, and the cilantro, however, is is doing fine, growing nicely. Um, this row here is an area where I need to actually, along this trellis here, I need to put more peas before we get too far along on the season. Uh, but the peas were fine. Excuse all the weeds. It's time to go weeding again. Uh, yeah, so let me show you where our cabbages just shriveled up and died. <laughs> like it was just way too much for them and they were too small. So looking back, what I could have done was just cover um, the bed with frost protection blankets and that would have prevented the issue so you can see back there in the back there now oh, that one's trying to come back alive it's been a couple of days since that hard frost and it warmed right up i think the highest we got was like 72 this weather's been crazy and all of these the majority of these chards that were coming up they also died the beets have, there's a couple of the larger ones that did pretty good with coming through, but the rest of them, they also died. So, oh, and these uh, 
had a Benny. Turnips are very resilient. They did good through the frost. There's a little bit of damage to those leaves there, but for the most part, they are fine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, we're just going to start fresh on this bed. Uh, I really wish that I would have thought to cover it up, but I didn't. And it just is what it is. It happens. Uh, it happens to me <laughs> probably more than most because we're living a life that's very busy um, outside of our responsibilities as homesteaders, as uh, bloggers, bloggers, we are parents, we are friends, and it's just so much to manage sometimes. So I'm not going to beat myself up. You, if you've got some small failures on the farm, in your garden, don't beat yourself up. Start fresh. And that's what we're going to do. What I'm going to do is going to top off uh, this bed with these soils here. I'm going to put the potting mix um, first. And then I'm going to put the Kellogg garden soil on top. So both of these are Kellogg. Both of these are Omri listed. And um, they, they've both been working really good for us. But what I'm going to do is add those in. And then some of those collards that we have been working on thinning in the high tunnel will be migrated out to this bed. And basically, I will use those collards the thin collards to just fill this area up. So those Hada Benny turnips should be um, ready for harvest here pretty soon. Some of those are not going to make roots, as you can tell. They're too close together, but the leaves, uh, the rabbits will eat, the chickens eat, and of course, we eat. So it's a win-win situation. And there's just a, another area where we've got some cauliflower that got some frost damage we planted those out in our garlic bed that one there in the middle has doubled in size so that's pretty cool to see don't know when the temperatures are going to drop below freezing again but i may need to pull out the blankets and just have them on hand and ready to go okay so as i'm looking along the row here um i think i'll probably pull some from this section here you see the leaves there that are turning like a purple purple bluish color I am pretty sure that is because there's too much competition in this little section for nutrients so I'll probably pull those and this little section here is looking pretty good some nice sized leaves in through here so I think we're pretty good here. And back in the back there is where I transplanted some already earlier this week. So those uh, perked up just nicely and there's room back there to transplant more. And then I also have this row here beside if I have um, a need to transplant anymore, we've prepped this row for planting as well. Okay, so it's a few days later because things got quite noisy and I wasn't able to finish the video, but there you have it, guys. I'm going to now fertilize with some fish emulsion and that's going to be it. We'll keep an eye. You can see they're still kind of droopy. They're very nice and perked up first thing in the morning and then as the day goes on, they droop a little. Um, but that's to be expected until they're fully established and I notice that usually takes about five days or so with the collards particularly. Mustards tend to take a little bit longer I've noticed. Alright, thanks for watching. This is Sheena. Have a good one.